Well, what? You know? That's what Gabsworth said. It's like, she's not that much of a woman. Well, the thing is that, that, that you know, that we, we have the predictions, all right? But understand that God's still involved. So and that's what we got to remember at all times. God's still involved. All right? I mean, I've seen... Look, you know, there's one, one guy I know uh, who ended up having surgery because there was a problem in the leg, and it's, they, 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 they did it wrong. So that his leg was actually about six inches shorter now than the other one. He was not a happy man. No. Not happy. So anyway, he's he's in bed, he's in bed, but he's a believer, right? So he's been hobbling around now for a while, and he just said, you know, God, you're going to have to do something. So he went, he got prayed for. He woke up in the morning. You know what happened? His legs back to normal size. So no, his his legs back to normal size. I mean, the, the one leg, God made it so that he's back to normal. Did it work, or did he not feel it? Like, he didn't feel it. He was asleep. They woke up the next morning. Was he, like, super surprised? Yeah, I would say so. Like, what? That makes no sense. But here's the thing. Here's the thing to remember. In one day, it just went from A to just B. Oh, yeah. Like, well, look, here's the thing. God does amazing things. God is not limited by what we think makes sense. He's not. I mean, if he can make everything... Well, let me put it this way. If he can raise the dead... Does, does, does somebody who's dead getting up make any sense at all? No. But he's able to do that. So, it's a small thing to make a leg go back to where it should be. You know, one of the things that we need to recognize is that God actually wants to touch people and bring them closer to himself. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. And that is that when Jesus died and rose from the dead, he wants his body, the church, to keep doing the things he did so that people get saved. And what that means is that some people are going to have exactly what I just mentioned. They're going to get prayed for, and their life's going to be healed. They're going to be prayed for, and the cancer is going to leave. They're going to get prayed for, and they're going to be delivered to demons. They're going to be prayed for, and all kinds of miraculous things are going to happen. All right? All of that's for a reason. God wants people to know that he's real, that the Bible's true, that Jesus is Lord, and that it's time to get right with him. Okay? So, yeah, it happens. It happens. We need to be... be you, know, you know what actually keeps people, a lot, even Christians... A lot of times, from receiving from God, it's not that God doesn't want to. It's just in our culture, we come to think that, well, if the doctor tells me something, then that's the end of the story. But you know what? It's not the end of the story. I have a book uh, written by a doctor. His name is Dr. Colbert. Dr. Colbert used to be a doctor over in Kendu. Okay? And his son, who I know, ended up having cancer in their knee. So they were going to have to go, they went to Mayo, and uh, they were going to take the cancer, you know, basically do what they could with the cancer. If they had to, they had to take the leg, right? So, took them to Mayo, and they, you know, they marked the leg to know which one it was. And they went in. And Dr. Culver had been for a while. I mean, remember, he's a doctor. He had been trained to know this is what happens and this can't happen. Can't happen, right? But because it's his son, you know, you find out that, you know what? God, if you can do it, I want you to do it. All right? So they, they pray for their son. They're waiting in the in the uh, in the in the in the room where uh, you know you, you're waiting for the doctor to come out and tell you what happened, right? So they're they're in the room and the doctor comes out and he says, 
Uh, the reason we were so long in there, because they were longer, is that is, um, you see, what, what, what had happened was that we went into that knee, and, and the tumor was gone. So we took him back to get the MRI to see if we actually went through the wrong leg. And it was actually the correct leg, and there's no tumors in him at all. He just miraculously vanished like that. So this is something that, you know, now what? It was a doctor who had often said, this can't happen. And now he wrote this book to let people know, yeah, it really can. Because God, Jesus is able. He's able. That doesn't mean that you, you know, throw out medicine. But at the same time, what he was saying is that sometimes what we tend to do is we tend to think, well, the doctor is the final word. Well, doctors are awful smart. And they do know how the body normally works. But that doesn't mean that they're the final word. God is. Okay? That's the thing to remember. So, you know, it's true that if God doesn't intervene, this is going to be a problem for her. But the good news is he does intervene. And so we just pray for that. Right, Jackson? Amen. Now that's actually going to bring us to this. Um, I want to start. We only have three classes left. This one, next Sundays, and then, and then April 7th. And then on the 14th, there's confirmation for Jackson, Hayden, and you two. Okay? And what, what I want to do then, these last three, is I want us to talk about the biblical view of what we're here for. Okay? Why are we here? And I want to start with uh, something that I want you guys to talk about. Uh, I have on the board here, what, what do you want to do or what you want to be with your life? You, what, what's your idea that when you get out of high school, this is what you want to do with your life? Just take a couple of seconds and I'm going to go around to ask you and then you can tell me. And by the way, nothing, don't, there, there isn't anything stupid. Just, you know, whatever top, thumbs pops in mind, this is what I really would like to do. Just, you know, let me know. It take a couple of seconds while I drink this. Think about it, and then I'll come to you, and I'll start with Aubrey Greedo here. All right. She wants to be an NASA scientist. <laughs> I don't blame you. So, like, you're saying what we want to do, or, like, what we're going to do after high school? Or, you know, what do like, you want to do in your life? Okay, what we're going to do in our life. Right, what you want to do in your life. Okay, and that can be, that, I mean, you know, do you want to, do, do you, you want to, uh, you want to have kids? Do you want to be married, have kids? you want to, uh, you want to be a doctor or a nurse? Do you, I mean, do you want to do that and that? You know, or do you want to, Work at McDonald's for the rest of your life and flip burgers. By the way, there's nothing, it's honorable work. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, what do you want to, what do you want to do? Talking mostly because when we first started, we started with just so good. You know what's really good right now? Isn't they grill? They can eat cheese to grill with a half pound. Yeah, you know what, though? Let me, let me tell you, the only thing the McDonald's makes. The only thing McDonald's makes that's any good is breakfast anyway. They, I, I don't care for their hamburgers. Their fry, after they went uh, with some kind of... Yeah, you know, I'm not really fond of them anymore because they changed the oil. See, I, I, like, I like the oil that actually hardens your arteries, and they took that away, and they made something healthy. Yeah, they're pretty clean fries are good. I, but I like, you know, I like the McDonald's. If I'm going to go to McDonald's, I, I want the breakfast burrito. I like that. I really do. With the, with the hash brown. That's good. So you can try that. All right. Anyway, I'm gonna go around here. Aubrey, uh, why don't you tell me what 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 you want to do with your life? Uh, go to college and major in like psychology. Yeah. And then become like a psychologist or um what is that called? Psychiatrist. Okay. And like get married, have kids, and like try to 
travel a lot too. Travel a lot. Like before I get married though. Before you get married. Get that out of the way. Yeah. All right. How about you, Naomi? Doctor. Um, there's two different kinds of doctors. I want to be either a psychiatrist or like, I mean, people don't really like what I do. So it's something like with the brain, like a mental doctor. Oh, okay. Um, probably get married. No kids. No kids? I don't like kids. Okay. All right. Well, that's fair. That's fair. All right, go ahead. Um, all I know is I want to go to college, and I don't know what else. And that's true. That some people don't know yet. It's fine. Uh, go to college, travel. I want to travel a lot. Um, get a good job. Not for sure something. Maybe in the medical field. And then marry and have kids. Marry and have kids. <laughs> What's that? I was like, she's fond of playing one that I have because I don't even know. Well, she's the older and wiser one. Yes. But my baby's my life That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's just what, you know, you, you don't know. And, and let me just say right now that, that I'm asking you this, but once you, know, once you actually get to that point in life, you can end up changing your mind entirely. I'm not, I'm not telling you to set your life in stone here. Just an idea of what you're thinking. All right, Jackson. Um, I don't know. I'll probably stay home and farm with my dad. Stay on the farm? I mean, I'll go to college and all that, but like, I, yeah, I, I want to farm. Well, you like farming. Yeah. Yeah, you know, praise God. My mom thinks I should be a teacher, but I don't know why. Well, and you know, there are some farmers that teach, too. Yeah, like, our principal, the first year I was in his wife, and all that. So, well, either one of those is fine. I mean, they're good. They're good. They're good. They're good things to have. You know, all of that's you know, all of those are honorable professions. But now, let me let me suggest let me let me ask you the next question. All right. What does God want you to do with your life? Well, praise him. We're going to go over that right now. It's going to take us a few, like the rest of our time. But let's start by looking at Matthew twenty-eight. 19 to 20. So open up Matthew 28, 19 to 20. And by the way, what I'm about to say here, God, God has a plan for your life, and that doesn't mean that you can't be a doctor. It doesn't mean that you can't be a teacher or a farmer. It just means that as you're a teacher, a doctor, a farmer, whatever you are, remember that God wants this giving the foundation for what you do. Whatever it is you're doing. Okay? Alright, so let's look at Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And uh, I'm going to start with Jackson over there. 19 and 20. And it's what you face this way because I, I need this to pick up your voice. Because we got people watching. Okay. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Okay. Yeah, that's good. So it's go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Jesus was telling the early church that they had two jobs. Make disciples, which of course means you're going to be baptized. And if you're going to be a disciple, that means that you have to do what Jesus says. Okay? So what Jesus has in mind for those that are believers is that you're going to be a disciple, and that means you're going to do whatever he says. You're going to follow him. Okay? We're going to get into what that means more. All right? But let's look at John 14, 12 now. John 14.12 is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John in the New Testament. John 14, verse 12. John 14.12. 
Okay, John 14, 12. All right, everybody there? All right. So listen, and read it, read it slowly but loud. Okay. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Okay, now that's Jesus speaking. Yeah. And right before, right before he was arrested, he said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, or the one who believes in me, the works I do, they will do also. And greater works than these shall they do, because I go to the Father. What that means then is that God intends that your life as a believer should be a life of miracles. A life filled with His power. A life that does the works that Jesus did. Uh, tell me some things that Jesus did. He raised many people from the dead. Okay, He raised people from the dead. What else? What? Alright, he did a lot of stuff. Name one. Well, the Father raised him from the dead by the Holy Spirit. Okay? What? Well, they are, but it's, it, it, they're, it, and they're all one God, but he was raised by the glory of the Father. That's what it says there. Okay. So, um, what else did he do? Yeah, with, uh, with five loaves and Two fish. All right. Okay, that's something we don't have to do. All right, because he did that. But there are certain things he did do. See, remember, Jesus, he's, he's God, okay, but he left his glory behind, and he became a perfect human being. He was filled with the Holy Spirit after he was baptized in the water. And he became our example for what the Christian life is going to be. Okay? Christians are to be baptized like he was baptized. So, should we be baptized? Yes. Uh, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Should we be filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes. And then he ended up finding himself at war with the devil. Did he overcome the devil? Yes, and we're called to be overcomers by speaking the word and living the word, okay? Did he, did he call people to repent, to turn away from sin and turn back to God? Yes, he did. Did he pray for people so they could be healed? Yes, he did. Everything that he did in his earthly ministry, he wants you to do. Now, that doesn't mean that every single second of every single day you're going to be doing that, but he wants you to be available so that when that comes, you're ready to go, okay? I don't know about you, but I find that exciting to know that he wants us to do what he did, Okay? And obviously, he, he wants to work in us to do that, not so that we can be glorified, but so that people can know about Jesus. I gave you an example of where this worked out. I, I was at a, um, we had a wedding here uh, this summer, and it was, it was Christy Felder's wedding, okay? And then after the wedding, we went down to the KC Hall to have the, um, the reception, and I was walking into the KC Hall. There was a man there uh, who thought I was a priest because I was wearing a collar. He said, hello, Father. And I said, hello. And then he saw that Debbie was with me, and he realized that I'm not a Catholic priest. So he apologized. I said, well, you don't need to apologize. And then, and then there was just an opening. The Holy Spirit showed me. He said, do you know Jesus? And he said, well, I, he said, if I could meet him, I'd be glad to believe in him. And I said, well, you know, you can, you can meet him today. He said, really? And there was like a lot of people left while well, it was just him and me. And we visited. He talked about his life. He talked about how he needed 
he was he felt like he was a horrible person that God could never love him and I said no I said you're not any different than anyone else all of us in the eyes of God have fallen away none of us is good enough by ourselves to be in his presence but he loves you and in Jesus he wants to make you new and I said are you are you willing to ask him into your life he said yes so we prayed he asked forgiveness for his sins. And then what happened was that he, he, he had been a man who was a drunkard. You know what a drunkard is? It's somebody that is continually drinking and getting drunk. All right, that's their lifestyle. It's what they do. Okay, they're a drunkard. Well, he went into the, uh, into the reception, and he found out that he had lost all of his appetite for alcohol. He, he, he didn't want to drink anymore. Who do you think did that for him? God. Jesus moved in on the Holy Spirit, took away that desire so that he could be new. He was absolutely amazed that God would love him that much and change him. So I didn't pick that moment. God picked that moment. But you see, you see the application. I was available. I heard from God. We had that conversation. I witnessed about Jesus and then Jesus moved in to save him. All right, we need to we need to be ready to do that. That doesn't mean that you'll be doing that every day, but if you're open to it, you'll be doing it. How would you like to be praying for somebody, and all of a sudden God heals them just like that? Wouldn't that be cool to say? He wants to do that with you. There was a lady uh, who was in one of, one of these meetings. Okay, we, we have them from time to time in the church, and uh, she came in on crutches. She couldn't walk without them, and so she came up to the front. I took the crutches away from her. We prayed in the name of Jesus for her healing and she said so what do I do now I said you have to walk and she said should I use my crutches or not I said you have to walk and she got up and she started walking across that, that that front there and she turned around looking at me with just plumb amazement on her on her face because now her legs were perfectly healed and strong and she was able to walk around. That, that's Jesus. He wants to do that in our lives. So that's why it's important that you understand that you can be, you can be a farmer, you can be a teacher, you can be a nurse, you can be a doctor, you can be flipping burgers. All of that's fine work. And believe me, if you don't think flipping burgers is honorable work, let me tell you, the lines are full of doctors and nurses and whatever waiting for their hamburger. All right? It's needed. All right? Because we all need to eat. But on top of that, I mean, below all of that, what God wants you to do is to be his disciple, a follower of Jesus. And that's what a disciple is. A disciple is someone, a definition for a disciple is follower of, of Jesus. But the word follower there means doing what he said and doing what he did. All right? That's what, and when you're coming to confirmation or when you're, you're going to be confirmed, that's one of the main things you're telling God you're going to do. I am available for you. And I'm willing to be used by you wherever you send me. Wherever I am, no matter what I'm doing, my first priority is to do things your way. So that you can be glorified. All right? Now let's see that one more time here in uh, Luke 5. Let's turn to Luke 5, 27 and 28. Right. 
Y'all there? All right. Aubrey, can I already, can I already have you read or no? No. Right, for this you read. All right. So uh, if you'll read Luke 5, 27 and 28, please. All right. So again, what does a disciple do? A disciple follows Jesus. Okay? And again, following means not only does he lead, it means you're going to do the same things. Now, stay on Luke because you're going to find out something else that Jesus did, that Luke did, or I'm sorry, Levi did. By the way, Levi is the same person as Matthew. All right? Many times the people at that, at that age uh, would have two or three names that they would go by. One was a Hebrew name, and one was a, um, was a Gentile name. Matthew was a Gentile name. Levi is the Jewish name. Okay. So anyway, let's look at... Um, let's look at the rest of that, and uh, Naomi... If you will read, I get there in a second. I don't think I need you to read all of that, but let's see. Luke 5. All right, yeah, verse 29. Just verse 29. Luke chapter 5, verse 29. Chapter 5, verse 29. People from Canada? Yeah. Who? They've been here for a while. Tom Anthony. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, they, they, they've been here. I think they're away right now. Oh. Yep. I think they're, at, I th I think they're actually in Florida. Oh. No. Yeah. Yeah. You, you leave when it's nice and warm now. You go down to Florida. But hey, you know. All right, go ahead. Luke uh, 5 29. Okay, so, by the way, reclining a table, what, what that means is that in that area of the world, and you still see that really from time to time, even in, in that area of the world and also in, in Japan and China, is that when they would eat, the tables were much lower. All right? And so reclining a table meant that they were like laying on their sides with pillows. And they would eat. They would eat that way. Okay. So that's why it says reclining is what they're talking about. Did they like sit on the floor? They would sit on the floor. Uh, mostly, if they wanted to be comfortable, they had pillows there, so you could recline on them. Oh, well, like in Indiana Jones, when he's like the pillows, like Indian people, and they like eat the baby snakes and stuff, and they're like sitting on the floor, like like really super low table. Okay, well, well, okay, well, yeah, the super, <clears throat> yeah, the, the super, the super, uh, the super low table is, yeah, that's exactly right. That's what, where they are. A lot of your, a, a lot of your Asian uh, cultures, that's where they would be. It's not that they didn't have chairs. It's chairs for other things. All right, but for eating, they'd be down on the ground. Okay. Now, the thing is that notice what Levi did. He went out and found sinners to share the good news about Jesus and invited them to meet Jesus because he was having a feast and Jesus was the, the, the man of honor there. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you're following him, then you're there to invite people to meet Jesus. That's what your whole life is about. And that means inviting your friends. Yes. How come tax collectors were so few? Well, that's a good question. Let me, let me give you the answer to that. There are two reasons. First of all, uh, the tax collectors 
were people that were working for the Roman government, and the Roman government was viewed as an oppressive power that was occupying their land. Okay, it would be like let's say that that um, Russia, just to mention a country, took over the United States, and and your neighbor began working for them, taking taxes from you. Well, the Russians would be considered. Well, they would just take it. I'm just going with, with, with this right now, okay? You would look upon them as a traitor because they were they were working for the foreign power and they had, they had come in and taken over your land, okay? So that's one reason. Now, the second reason that you pointed to was the other reason, and it's actually even more serious than working for a foreign power. The tax collectors at that time were allowed to tax you whatever they wanted. So the Roman government would say, just for example, uh, we need you to collect 10% tax from these people. However, the Roman government didn't pay the tax collector. The way the tax collector got paid is that they would up the amount of taxes so they could make money off of this. And it was legal. So in other words, uh, let's say that, Jackson, you owe me 10% of $100,000 that maybe your, your farm would make. But I tell you, you owe me 50%. There isn't thing one you can do about it, because if you don't pay me, I'll have the troops come and take everything you own, and I'll get my 50%, plus I'll take the other 50 So they were dealing with... What's that? So they were dealing with socialism back then? Uh, well, it was, it, yeah, it, they, were, they were dealing with, with, with government taking over and regulating everything. Okay, they were. Well, there, it really isn't any different because ultimately it's about domination. Okay, taking what doesn't belong to you. All right, so anyway, the, the, the tax collectors were hated because one, they were working for the foreign government that had invaded the land and taken it, so they were looked upon as traitors. And then two, none of the tax collectors were known for being honest. If the Roman government was asking 10%, they could ask for as much as they wanted. And what's more is that if you were a cheap tax collector like Zacchaeus was, that meant you had tax collectors working under you. And they all and they had to kick back to you some of what they made. Which means what? Well, if I'm if I'm charging them ten percent for the right to work for me, then they're gonna charge that extra ten percent on to you so they can get it back. Okay? So as much as we don't like the IRS and their foolishness. They're choir boys compared to what was going on at that time. Okay? They're choir boys. So that's why that's why the tax collectors were so hated. But again, remember, Luke had met Jesus. I'm sorry, not Luke, it's in Luke. Levi had met Jesus and heard the call to follow him, to be his disciple. So what did he do? Well, to be a disciple means you're going to share Jesus with others. And then you'll share Jesus in a number of different ways. Sometimes it's for praying for people. Sometimes it's just by showing mercy in other ways. Like inviting people to your home so that you can meet Jesus, or in this case, maybe meet somebody who's sharing about Jesus. Okay? That's what God wants to do with your life. He wants you to be a disciple. Now, my question to you is, um, if he wants you to be a disciple, and a disciple means that you're going to do what Jesus did, what's one thing that Jesus did that maybe you would want to do starting today? Well, one thing. What? 
Okay, Sharon, more? Sharon, when he's done? Okay, what else? All right, one of the things that we find that Jesus did that we're called to do is that he was someone who was in the Bible day and night. Every day, every night, he was someone that memorized and put deep in his heart the Word of God. Okay? If we're going to follow him, we've got to do the same thing. He was The Word of God was his final authority. It needs to be ours. Okay? What else? Well, let me ask you something. Is there anybody, anybody, could be anybody, by the way, is there anybody that um, really annoys you? And in fact, they've annoyed you so much that you just downright don't want to be around them. Okay? And, and it might even be accurate, it might even be accurate to say that from time to time you even hate them. Well, let me put it, let me put it to you this way. You may say, well, okay, I may not hate them, but I don't necessarily wish them well either. All right? Would that be true for, for some of you? What is it that Jesus did when his enemies beat him up, whipped him until they could see the bones in his body? That's what he did. Let's look at that. Uh, look at, uh, I believe it's in the Gospel of Luke. And I believe it's Luke 24. But let me check. Yep, Luke 23, I'm sorry. Look at Luke 23. Verse 34. Luke 23, verse 34. And Aubrey Greedle, if you will just read 34 to the end of that quote where, you, uh, where Jesus is speaking. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Okay. Father, forgive them. All right, now, here's the thing we need to remember, okay? Was, was Jesus perfect? Yes, he was. He never sinned, he never did anything wrong, and yet these people did unspeakable torture to him. He, he had, all he had done his entire life was do the will of God, and the world basically said, don't want nothing to do with you. And they put him on a cross to kill him. Right? After they beat him up so that he was just bleeding to death anyway. And yet he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now let me explain something to you. If Jesus will forgive them, you need to forgive them too. Do you know why? Because Jesus didn't do anything wrong. But he forgave him. I just want to ask you a question. Can you claim that you've never done anything wrong? You can't. I mean, that's honest. None of us can. All right? Sometimes, sometimes what comes our way, if we're honest, comes from our own mouth. Sometimes we've done things where, you know, it just comes back to get us because you reap what you sow. And so there are times when I got mad at people, upset with them, and then I realized that, yeah, you know what? 
But I was just joking. Well, they didn't take it as a joke. And they maybe went overboard, but maybe you shouldn't have been running your mouth. And so here's the thing. We need to forgive others because we don't know what we're doing sometimes and we create the problem and they don't know what they're doing. And we just need to remember that if we're going to follow Jesus, if I want... If I want people to forgive me, or if I want God to forgive me, you would go there. Then I need to forgive. And forgiveness does not mean that you're saying that what they did is okay. Jesus isn't saying that what they did is okay. But what what we're forgiving is we're saying, I'm praying that you be blessed and not be cursed. I'm praying for your best and not for the worst thing to happen to you. I'm asking God to, to bring his blessings into your life. All right? So, being a forgiving person, being a forgiving person, is what it means to be a disciple. It means you're going to forgive people who've hurt you, even if they've hurt you and you've done nothing. Except follow God. Although most of the time we can't really say that we're, we're completely innocent. There are times when we've done things that have caused a backlash. That makes sense to you? So one of the things that we probably should, should make ourselves uh, confess is that, you know what? I am going to forgive like Jesus. Okay? Okay, what else? What are other things that he did that, that we might decide to do today? And I don't mean just do it today, but begin to do it and just keep doing it. What's that? Pray more. more. Yes, amen. Pray for what, Zach? Anything? Well, I mean, that's good. You can pray for anything, but let me ask you. Um, Well, let's go with with Avery, okay? Does she need prayer? Yeah, so we're going to pray. Continue to pray for healing until it comes. Okay? Or do you know somebody that that, that needs uh, to be comforted? We're going to pray for them and we're going to comfort them. Okay? Prayer is a big part of Christian life. It doesn't mean that you have to pray 24-7. But nevertheless, when a need comes up, we're going to pray. See, one of the things we, we, we don't want to do is we don't want to do this. Somebody says, you know what? So-and-so is really in need. Keep her in prayer. Yep, sure will. And then what happens? We forget all about it. That certainly was my habit. You know what I do now when somebody says, so-and-so is in the hospital. They really need prayer. You know what I do? Let's pray right now. Right now. Stop what we're doing. We're going to pray right now. Because if they mention the need, then we need to deal with it right now. Don't wait. Pray. Okay? When people came to Jesus, you never see him saying to someone, you know what? I'll deal with that later. No, right now. We'll deal with it right now. Let's pray. Okay? And bring it to God. No, but I mean, I'm just talking about, well, like, for instance, you know, we heard about Avery earlier on, and then Katie Jo, what would we do before we did anything else? Pray for them. And we keep on praying. And, you know, another thing to remember is that Jesus prayed. He was a regular prayer. He prayed a lot. And he took time out of his busy schedule to get with God. We'll talk more about this next week. And find out what God had in mind for him, what the Father had in mind. We should do what he did. You know what that would require us to do? Probably. 
watching less TV, playing on our phones a lot less, and spending time alone thanking the Lord and seeking what He wants. Okay? By the way, I know that you guys are just looking at each other, but, but the fact of the matter, there are a lot of adults that need to learn that too. Turn the phone off. Turn the TV and the computer off. Turn the radio off. And get them done. Okay? See, the thing we need to remember is that God is trying to talk to us all the time, but a lot of times he speaks in that still small voice in our heart. And if we hear a whole lot of this other nonsense going on around us, it's distracting us and we're not really listening. And we need to listen. Jesus listened, and if we're going to follow him, then we need to listen to him. Okay? All right, any questions so far? All right, next week... We're going to talk about holiness and what that is. Okay? Because we're called to be holy. All right. Well, then I'll let you go. Let's pray. Okay? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Lord, you've called us to be disciples. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray by the Holy Spirit that you would empower us to follow you and to do the work in the kingdom that you would have us do. Lord, show us how to do it at school, show us how to do it in our families, show us how to do it with our friends, show us how to do it wherever we are, so that your name is glorified, and so that we can be, it can be said of us that we are followers of Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We'll see you guys next week.